Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sixth and I. I'm Jackie Leventhal, and I'm the Chief Brand and Content Officer here. We often like to start out by asking, by show of hands, for how many of you is it your first time at Sixth and I? A lot of you. All right. A big welcome to everyone, and especially to our first timers. So tonight's event is the latest installment in an ongoing partnership which brings the Atlantic's journalism to life on our stage through conversations with its leading editorial voices about the topics most relevant to our lives. With the December issue, The Atlantic debuted a new visual identity in print and online, and it's a really stunning look to match the expertise and integrity of the journalism behind it. The most recent issue, How to Stop a Civil War, examines how unprecedented partisanship, the radically uneven distribution of wealth, the rise of technology, and structural failures in American democracy have divided our country and yet how we might be able to preserve our unity. Some of the most esteemed writers whose essays appear in this issue are here tonight. Yoni Applebaum, the ideas editor at The Atlantic, examines how America can survive the massive demographic shift now underway. Caitlin Flanagan, a contributing writer at The Atlantic for nearly 20 years, makes the case for mutual empathy in perhaps the most divisive debate of all, abortion. And Adam Serwer, a staff writer at the magazine focusing on politics, offers a dissent to the idea that we should prize a return to civility and argues against reconciliation as a substitute for truth telling. They'll be joined by The Atlantic's fearless leader and editor in chief, Jeffrey Goldberg. He is an award winning journalist, a frequent voice on our stage, and a longtime friend to Sixth and I. There's much to discuss, and we have some of the best minds to help us understand what's happening in our country right now. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to The Atlantic. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out. Um, uh, we do this frequently with Six and I, uh, and we're very, very grateful for this partnership. Um, we're particularly grateful that uh, Six and I is in good shape this week. Last week, I think all of you know, um, there was an anti-Semitic attack on the synagogue. Swastikas were drawn. Um, I do want to, I can't help it, I, I do want to um, note that the very brave security officer, Christian Thomas, uh, who stopped the knife-wielding attacker, uh, is uh, with us in the synagogue tonight, protecting the synagogue, and so he deserves a round of applause. Uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna jump in, in in just one second, and of course there will be time for questions, and I'll give you a little bit of forward notice on that. Uh, but uh, I, I want to just uh, make uh, one quick comment about the, the issue, which I hope uh, many of you uh, uh, have read. I hope many of you have bought, to more to the point. <laughs> I don't care if you read it, but just buy it. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the notion for this issue uh, springs from our, from our history. Uh, the Atlantic was founded in 1857, um, obviously at a time of great national fracturing um, to do two things. One was to bring about the end of slavery. It was an abolitionist magazine, of course. Um, the second was to refine and illuminate the American idea. The founders of the Atlantic didn't define the American idea in, the, in their opening manifesto. They, I, I believe they sort of left that idea there for succeeding generations of journalists to figure out. Um, but because we, because, because we uh, uh, come out of... Uh, uh, this Civil War tradition, um, we take the idea that, uh, we take the idea of, a, of, a, of American impermanence seriously. We don't believe, I don't think anybody on this stage believes that, that uh, uh, conditions in America now resemble conditions in any way of the 1850s, certainly not 1860 or 1861, but something feels different uh, about this period, not only because uh, of the, the current occupant of the White House. Uh, one of the one of the underlying uh, assumptions or suppositions of this issue was that uh, President Trump is as much a symptom 
of something as a cause of, of, of something. And that's what we asked uh, many of uh, our writers, uh, staff writers and outside writers to, to grapple with. I'll start with, uh, with Yoni, who, who, uh, did one of the, who wrote one of the anchor pieces of this issue. Uh, he, he, he makes the argument, or he makes several arguments, uh, tightly bundled, that, uh, that we are facing um, a, a set of unique challenges in America, in part because of demography. And so I thought maybe just to set this conversation up a little bit, Yoni, you will take um, 74 seconds to give us the entire body of your understanding <laughs> of the future of America. Yoni is a PhD in American history, so he knows a lot of things, so I have to contain it. But, but if you can contain yourself, go ahead. All right. You're down to 72 seconds. <laughs> So my colleagues came to me and we started talking about this issue. Uh, the question was posed, uh, look back at other episodes in American history. Are we about to plunge into civil war? And at first I dismissed it. We're not going to walk out of here and fix bayonets. Um, we've been uh, at a number of periods in our past. Uh, we've faced far more political violence. Uh, we've, we've seen greater division. Um, but the more that I thought about that, the more worried I became. Um, because at several moments in our political past, we faced greater violence and, and seen more division. It can get worse. It can get a lot worse than it is right now. Uh, and there's a through line through those earlier episodes in our past. Uh, they have often cropped up at moments when the nation's dominant cultural majority uh, fears its eclipse, uh, is afraid that the tide of demographic change is going to wash over it, uh, that it will uh, see the reins of, of political power slip through its grasp. Uh, and at those moments, that majority faces a, a really decisive branching point. Uh, it can decide to uh, embrace a more capacious form of American identity. Uh, it can decide that new immigrant groups to this country are equally American as, as the well-established residents of this land. Uh, or it can double down on its identity and wall itself off and turn toward counter-majoritarian politics, toward institutions uh, that uh, can cement its grip on power and away from democracy. And at various points, uh, the majority in this nation has flirted with that, uh, and in the Civil War actually embraced that approach. Uh, and so we're again at one of those moments uh, where the dominant majority uh, for most of our lifetimes, uh, this has been a white Christian nation. It, it recently ceased to have a white Christian majority. Uh, within our lifetimes, it's likely to cease to have a white majority. Uh, and, and that old majority needs to decide what to do about it, whether to enlarge uh, the definition of, of what it means to be American and embrace that future and compete for votes or whether to turn against democracy. And, and you can look at the last few years in American politics uh, as a bold experiment in turning against democracy in counter-majoritarian politics. Could you just uh, drill down on one, one thing very quickly? The, the idea that, um, uh, and you've articulated in this piece and other, other pieces, that we don't have a model yet in, 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 in the history of the world of a democracy transitioning toward a multicultural democracy uh, well or peacefully. Is that a fair, go, go into that a little bit because we really are in uncharted territory. I think. Yeah, I don't know that we have a great model of multicultural democracy out there. Uh, America has been an experiment from the founding and uh, we've continually experimented with the form this democracy has taken uh, and now we're embarked on a new experiment. Uh, you really can't look back at, at early America and say that it's a, a genuinely multicultural nation. Uh, and so we're trying something new, and, and there's uh, a great deal of resistance to it. And like every phase of the American past, uh, it's a fragile experiment. We don't know whether or not this will work because it's never been tried before. Uh, but that's what they would have said at the founding. Uh, it's certainly what they said at the Civil War. Uh, and at various moments, Americans have doubled down on the promise of the founding uh, rather than, than turning against it. Um, and, and so that's the nature of the gamble at this moment. Right. Caitlin, uh, your piece... Uh, deals in, 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 on one level, it is about the most contentious, or one of the certainly most contentious issues in American life today and for the last decades, uh, the issue of uh, abortion. Uh, but it's also about the way Americans talk to each other. Um, so my question for you is, is what has changed in, in, in your view in the way that Americans discuss politics with each other? Well, I think there's an idea that you can't even listen to the other idea, that that would be inherently dangerous to you, to your point of view, and, um, and that we're almost afraid of hearing other ideas, in a sense. 
And I thought with abortion, I often notice, you know, I have a very clear feeling about it, most people do, but that if somebody even tries to discuss some middle ground about it, the other person just says, nope, I'm not hearing that, that has nothing to do with me, I've made my decision. And I thought, you know, we'll, we'll probably never agree on this issue, all of us as a country, but the very best argument of both sides is a pretty darn good argument, and if I could write them both in a way that the other side would see what the other side was thinking and feeling in a way that wasn't a screaming thing and it wasn't pictures of babies in some horrible, gruesome ways. If it was just, this is the best argument of these people and this is the best argument of these people, so that at least you could see some common humanity in the other side, I thought that would be a contribution to it. Do you... Um, are you confident that people on the other side, on both sides of that issue, could do this? I mean, I understand how influential an Atlantic article can be, but um, do you have any real hope that, uh, that people uh, are ready and willing to actually sit down and, and fully take in others, uh, the arguments of others, especially on these hot-button issues? Well, on this issue in particular, I got quite a bit of um, contact, you know, through social media and through my website, of people who are pro-life and remain pro-life, but said, this is the first time that I really thought about what it would have been like for these women and saw what these women were up against. And so I thought, well, that's a small victory, but it's a bit of a victory that they could see that, it's the, that the stere each side has a stereotype of the other as this really extreme person. And I think partly with abortion, it's such a a cultural divide, not just in beliefs, but sort of in lifestyle, everything, you know, it's very rare to see somebody who's, this is probably a horrible generalization, but I feel that um, it's rare to see, I won't even say it, I'll just say <laughs> that there's, I remember my father once saying to me, I mean, I'm from a very pro-choice family, but that he was something on the television, he said, you know, every now and then, I think maybe those people have a point, but then I see those people and I go, yeah! And, and I thought, that's just the culture. It's a different culture. And we kind of have to open up maybe to each other. Do you think, this is a, and I'll come to Adam in a second, and, and Adam can actually deal with the same question, but in so-called mainstream journalism right now, we have this challenge. None of us ha ha has met this challenge yet. There is 35 to 40% uh, uh, of the American population um, that votes for Trump um, that doubles down. Uh, in, in, in ordinary politics, uh, in ordinary political physics, he would have come far, far down already. Um, every time something happens that's outside the norm or just frankly outrageous, um, he, he solidifies his, his hold over a large portion of certainly white America, possibly even the majority of white America. Um, do you think that there is anything that mainstream journalism can do in fact-based journalism to actually move people from that camp or get them to deal with this issue in a more complicated way? Or have we just become too tribal for that to penetrate? Well, that's our job, you know, because we're the ones who are creating this mainstream journalism um, and our decisions about what we should include in it and what this moment demands be included and what this moment doesn't want to have included. Um, but I did get a lot of people saying, how the hell did you ever get this through? People who liked the pro-life section of the essay, you know, I never thought the mainstream media took any note of me and took any notion that, that I was a person with, real, with um, reasonable ideas and I never thought they would treat me respectfully. So I think there's a lot to be gained, but do you go from there to uh, you know, to changes on anything, I don't know. But they were certainly, that was the main response I got was from pro-life people saying they were glad to see that section. Adam, talk for a minute about, about your, your core argument, which has to do with the, the limits of, of reconciliation. I mean, one of the reasons we asked Adam to um, be the skunk at the already depressing garden party <laughs> um, uh, was because we want to pressure test the idea that reconciliation um, is a, is a positive value. And, and Adam, you wrote about uh, the limitations of reconciliation historically. Uh, and by that, I mean you, you use uh, Reconstruction America 
and, and talk about how uh, the North and South came together again in many ways, but on the backs of African Americans. So talk about uh, what you worry about in the present. So uh, my piece is provocatively titled Against Reconciliation, but it is actually an argument against a very specific type of reconciliation. And what my piece argues essentially is that our civility problem is a symptom of our polarization problem, which is itself a symptom of the unresolved race question in American democracy. Uh, and so what you see is the parties are increasingly polarized along racial, cultural, and religious lines with one party largely being made up almost entirely of white Christians and the other party uh, being the party of everyone else. And when parties are polarized along those lines, even if there is significant policy agreement uh, between the two sides, the conflict becomes one of identity and it becomes existential and the stakes become um, difficult to see past in very important ways, which is part of why our political conversation is so heated. Um, but in the past, particularly when you look at, when you look at the 1870s, I mean, the, this, the, the issue is titled how to prevent a civil war, but my argument is essentially what you really want to prevent is you know, the aftermath of Reconstruction. Because what happened in the aftermath of Reconstruction was that white people in the North and white people in the South uh, essentially came together on the basis of the exclusion of black people from the polity. Um, and that was, you know, reflected in literature, it was reflected in art, it was reflected in the political conversation. Um, and, and that was a kind of reconciliation, but one, in my view, that w uh, was a complete anathema to what democracy actually is. And ultimately, democracy is a system for managing conflict. If you are having absolutely no conflict, that's probably a sign that something is wrong. Uh, so it, when I say against reconciliation, what I really mean is we should be against the kind of reconciliation uh, that would, uh, quote unquote, bring the country together in a way that um, it does not resolve the fundamental questions of justice that we are currently uh, disputing and arguing over. Do you think that um, that portion of white America that might be resistant to to that kind of change, do you think that there's any softening there, or do you think that actually we've been in a, in a long process of reaction, uh, reaction in part toward the Obama presidency itself? Uh, I, I guess I'm asking you uh, on the sort of optimism, pessimism scale where you are this week. So I guess what I would say is my priority is not, um, is not it, it, it one side or the other winning in a partisan sense. My concern is that uh, on, the, uh, on the Republican side, there is a fear that if they do not change the rules in a way that, um, in an undemocratic way, that they're never going to win again, and that that means abandoning a system where they're capable of losing. Right. Um, and so I'm not talking about, you know, Democrats winning every election forever, but what I am talking about is a multiracial democracy where your uh, ability to participate in the system is not determined by whether or not you have a membership in the historically dominant demographic group in American society. Right, right. Yoni, you're, uh, I, I might get this slightly wrong from memory, but the opening line of your piece is, democracy requires the consent of the losers. Is that correct? Yeah. Could you, um, I memorized your whole piece. <laughs> um, could, uh, I do that for everyone. Um, could you explain what you mean by that? Because it feeds right off of what Adam is talking about. First, you've got to do the second line. Right. Um, no, I, I mean, I listen to Adam and he, he scares me because there's this broad political science literature out there on emerging democracies and struggling democracies, uh, and, and they tend to share two features before they're really in trouble. One is uh, a, a large chunk on the right which believes it can no longer win elections, uh, and the second is the conviction among those people that they can't afford to lose elections. And if you put those two things together, if, if you don't think you can win according to the rules of democracy, and also you are convinced that to lose means your destruction or the destruction of your culture or your way of life, um, you can't expect that somebody's going to look at that and say, well, gosh, I, I, I'm just gonna abide by the results of this election. Uh, and in fact, uh, over and over again, you, you can watch uh, right wings in, in countries where people become convinced of that, turn against democracy itself, uh, turn against the democratic process, cease to abide by the outcomes of elections. Do you see that happening now? Yeah, sure. You, you can see, what are the biggest signs to you? You can look across uh, America right now and, and see that in many states, 
uh, gerrymandering is, is a bipartisan sin, uh, but it is much more heavily indulged by Republicans than Democrats at the moment. Uh, restricting the franchise and, and uh, shutting down polling places, we, we effectively ended the Voting Rights Act, and, and as a result, uh, in, in many southern jurisdictions, which have been under court review, uh, the second those restrictions were yanked, they started shutting down hundreds and hundreds of polling places in predominantly black areas. Uh, you don't need to rig an electorate if you think you can fight an election and win fairly. Uh, you rig the electorate at the moment when you are convinced that the only way to maintain your grip on power is to do so. And, and you, know, you can go on and on with the examples, um, but you, you can see among many state and local Republican officials, as well as at the national level, a conviction that the only way to keep winning is, is to change the rules of the game. And, and that's profoundly disquieting. Right. Caitlin, I, I want to I uh, come back to something that you said. You were alluding to, um, to the issue of contempt in, in public discourse. After your piece was published, I, I did get the same sort of emails about it that, that you got, um, including, uh, including from one person I know very well who is ardently pro-life or anti-abortion, um, who said, um, it was, it's a pleasure to be, I mean, you're recognizing that you're pro-choice, mm -hmm. but it's a pleasure to be talked about without contempt. Um, in another uh, essay in this uh, very large issue, uh, Jim Mattis talks about, uh, he has a famous saying, uh, that uh, the, the real national security danger in America is that we've lost affection for each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back to this issue of contempt and the way people talk to each other. You are, you, you, Caitlin just came in from LA where she lives. It's, you live in the bluest blue part of, of America. Um, do you see tribalization now in a way that as a reporter you didn't see tribalization 20 or 30 years ago? Well, I grew up in the 60s and 70s in Berkeley, which was a very wild time. And Which means I, LA is like a Republican state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like Goldwater yeah, it's Republicans. It's like Orange County to you, yeah. And for a long time in this experience of being under this president, or however we want to put it, I thought, no, I've seen, I've seen people just lose the path altogether. Like, I just have seen people, you know, in Berkeley in the 60s and 70s, people were, young people coming to the university, were really leaving their families because they had such disagreement about the war and about many things. They were dropping out of the university constantly, huge numbers. A lot of them ended up to be very sad people. They got very drug addicted and, you know, the movement, you know, history moved forward and they didn't get to move forward. So there was a long time that I thought, we're not there yet. But there was something, I can't even remember what it was that Donald Trump said just about a week ago and I thought, yeah, this is worse. This is, this is just, I, I, that feeling everybody has that you can't you wake up and you realize what's happening and you realize what the President of the United States is saying and you realize, as much as my parents hated Richard Nixon, he just seems like this statesman, you know, and this... But how much of this for you is, is, is Donald Trump? All of it. All of it? It's just... You mean um, if Trump disappeared tomorrow or voted out of office or impeached, you think we would return to some facsimile of normalcy? No, I think that, well, I don't think we really were in a facsimile of normalcy, but he gave, I, I was a school teacher before being a writer, and, you know, I, certain people within a school really set the tone of the school, certainly the school head sets the tone, a class president or a really popular kid sets a tone, and I thought, oh, I'm too, too sophisticated to think that my president sets a tone that would affect me or affect people that I meet. Um, that's corny. But with this, I think he's given everyone this permission to say the things, maybe it's good, maybe we're really getting a look at each other, but to say and to do the things that, that they have been sort of hiding or, or keeping just in, within their families and their friends. But there's also a sense that more people are kind of, not in numbers, but more people that maybe didn't have that extreme view, their friends are having it, their community's having it, and they're starting to buy into it as well. So I just, I just, I think, it's, I think it's worse. What would you do to change it? Get a new president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, Adam, go, go to this question uh, 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 Caitlin uh, raised. The, the idea that actually what's happening now is that people are speaking honestly with each other. You know, there was that brief uh, Obama spring when, when 
mainstream commentators said, oh, we're post-racial now. We've elected an African-American president. We're all good. Um, Even Obama tried to get them to stop saying that. Anyway. Well, no, it, we, we've obviously, we're, we're long past that moment when anybody who's looking at the country would say that. But or what, is what we're seeing now a, a, a reaction to the shock some white people felt that a black person could be elected president? And is what we're seeing now um, a manifestation of a kind of racial, ethnicized, almost tribal honesty? Which is to say, all that stuff was just there, and Trump moved it from dog whistling on the margins to just Tucker Carlson's show. I think that, um, so two things. I think that th th there's absolutely no question that um, resentment of Obama played a role in a man who had previously identified as a Democrat who then uh, became famous for questioning whether or not the first black president was born in the United States. Uh, skyrocketed to the uh, top of the polls in the Republican primary in 2011, and then won an election in 2016. Uh, I don't think I, I think you know you don't need to be a, a mathematician to add those two things together. Uh, I do think that you know Trump is a symptom of a larger issue, and I think honesty is maybe the wrong way to put it. I think that. Um, I think that what Trump has done is he is, has recognized that uh, a substantial portion of the country feels ex extremely threatened by some of the changes that have been occurring, and he is extremely good at both exacerbating and exploiting those fears. When you see Donald Trump go up and say, we can finally say Merry Christmas again, which is like not a thing that you know, nobody ever stops saying Merry Christmas, or like... <laughs> The liberals want to change the name of Thanksgiving. I mean, these are sort of cartoony ways in which uh, Donald Trump tries to cultivate a sense of cultural threat in his audience. And because what he wants is to say to them or to encourage in them the belief that he is the only thing standing between them and Armageddon. And once they've accepted that belief, then nothing that Donald Trump does can be wrong because he's protecting you. He is the thing between you and destruction. Um, and, and, and that's not actually what's happening in the real world. Do people, some people honestly feel that way? Yes, they do feel that way, and we should acknowledge that, but it's not actually true. But it is a foundation of Trump's particular style of politics to cultivate that sense of siege. And, cultiv and, and he is, um, you know, he's probably not the only political figure in American history who's like this, Andrew Johnson comes to mind, but he is, absolutely indifferent to whatever the other social consequences of that kind of politics is. And so we are bearing the consequences of that form of politics. Um, but, you know, did he invent it? Did he create those sentiments? He did not. He is simply a master at exploiting them and completely indifferent to the consequences of what exploiting them does. How, how play out the consequences? Um, if there's another Trump term, what does that mean for... It's all right. It's just a theoretical. <laughs> it's a theoretical. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I, I can't make any guesses, but when you look at the fact that the president was investigated for, uh, you know, participating in a foreign influence campaign in, in the 2016 election, and the day after that happens, he attempts to extort a different foreign country into framing a political rival for a crime that never occurred using taxpayer dollars. Uh, when you look at that, um, you see that the limits of what Trump is willing to do in his own interest, whether financial or political, uh, simply do not exist as long as there are no political consequences for that. And in a situation where someone with those instincts is rewarded for that kind of behavior, uh, I think you get to a very dangerous place. I wouldn't speculate on what that means, um, but I do not think it is something that Americans want to trifle with. Right. Okay, I want to jump off something Adam said, because there's, there's an interesting conversation on the right uh, and when you dove into this issue uh, of abortion, I think you, you heard this again and again, which is, yeah, there are a lot of people on the right who recognize that Donald Trump is all of the things that, that Adam knows he is, um, but uh, he is using the presidency to put judges on the bench 
who will make abortion illegal. Um, and if you believe, I mean, you're putting yourself in the worldview of someone who believes this, if you believe that abortion is murder and that there's a million murders in America each year, then it makes perfect sense. In other words, that there is a, there's a, there's a, cult, there's a political logic based on the cultural and religious importance of an issue to supporting Donald Trump. Can you talk about that community and talk about the divide um, that that represents between people who are pro-choice? I want to keep going at this because I, I, mean, I, I guess I'm in the, in, the, in the doubting category. It was a wonderful piece that you wrote, uh, but I don't think that this is an issue where people move because they've read something very, very persuasive and elegantly written. Well, I think that... Um this is the whole point of, of our side, if one's pro-choice, taking the very scary leap to listen to what they're saying. And when you really listen to it, it does confront you morally. You know, the difference between 1974, when Roe was decided, and today, is that we have this intense use of maternal sonography. And we're getting a look at earlier, very early, you know, it's just a, it was a very rarely used thing for risky pregnancies, and it was in its infancy, in a sense, in the past, and now it's so sophisticated, it's just standard of care for just about every pregnancy, and we all get a look, and we all have to say, I have to account for that in my decision-making. And for me, personally, I'm like, yeah, I account for that, and yet I'm the daughter of a woman who was a nurse in the 1950s at, in Bellevue Hospital and sat with two girls while they died from botched abortions. As, and she said, the last people they saw beside my mother were New York City detectives who tried to get them to say the name of the person who'd done it. And she said they were both so terrified, because they would always tell you, you can never say my name, that neither of them said it. So I've, I've looked at both things and, and made my decision, but I think that idea that it is murder, although I've made my decision, I don't think that's an absurd notion that they have. I mean, that's, I think that's why people don't want to talk about abortion, because when you really talk about it, both, like, the argument I just gave is an excellent argument. Women, you know, you make abortion illegal, all you do is drive women to just extremely dangerous conditions to get an abortion. It's a deep, e eternal need of women is to have abortion care within their, their reproductive abilities. So um, that's that argument. And the other argument is, you know, we've got premature babies that are surviving at earlier and earlier and earlier weeks, and that's all part of their logic and their experience. So I think it's softening ourselves. Maybe I just tried to not think so much about what they, them and they, and what are they doing, but I thought, what are they, because you just see them, we present ourselves at our ugliest about choice, and they present themselves at their ugliest about pro-life. They, you know, we have the worst representatives making the most important arguments to the public. Um, but I thought maybe underneath all of that is that is very charitable to think this on, on either side, but, but I thought what's underneath all of that, you know, I don't believe in the religious argument at the moment of conception, but this yelling and screaming and murder and all of that is it trying to account as best they can for what we all see on sonograms and take into account for our position. Yoni, when did, when did compromise go out of style in American politics? <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a good question. I, I don't know that it was ever entirely in style, and I also don't. Well, it was certainly in style in the in the House uh, House representatives of Bob Michael, or you know, the pre, in the pre Gingrich era, right? There was a it was sure. considered a value. So this was the thing: we weren't as well aligned back then, right? There were Southern Democrats and there were Northern Democrats. There were Rockefeller Republicans. There were conservative Republicans. If you have parties that are not ideologically aligned, it's a heck of a lot easier to strike a compromise. Um, and, and this is, when I listen to Caitlin talking about seeing people honestly, I want to believe that good journalism can change minds. Uh, but I know that the thing that usually makes you treat your political foes with a degree of respect is that there's somebody in your life you care about who profoundly disagrees with mm -hmm. you. And fewer and fewer Americans have that experience anymore. Honesty is not the only political virtue. If, if your spouse walks up to you and says, honey, does this make me look fat? Um, <laughs> honesty is not actually the best response at that moment. It, it, if you're going to live with somebody, if you're going to live with somebody, you're going to have to figure out a way to get along, even though you may have different views of the facts, even though you may have different profound moral commitments. And you've got to recognize their moral commitments and give them the respect, do those moral commitments, and then find a way to get along. 
Um, and that, I think, is what's gone out of style, right? We, we now live increasingly in communities which are politically segregated, racially segregated, that's up over the last 50 years, economically segregated. Uh, we're, we're less and less likely to have these kinds of intimate relationships with people with whom we disagree. Uh, and if you get things which are really nicely aligned, like these two ideological parties we have today, uh, like American politics and, and culture in general, uh, it gets harder and harder to see the other side as human beings. And, and that makes it hard not just to arrive at the compromise, uh, but to do the other trick that, that's necessary for pulling off democracy, to refuse to compromise, to profoundly disagree, and still to regard the other person as, as a friend. The, so I want to dissent from Yoni's point a little bit. Um, we have one party that is extremely ideologically aligned, but you have another party which is not that ideologically aligned. And you look at, you look at the Democratic Party as a party that remains made up of uh, liberals, moderates, and some conservatives, although that number is shrinking. But it's also made up of people from very different walks of life. Uh, you know, the, 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 the hipsters in New York City who are voting for AOC are not the same as the church ladies in South Carolina who... Uh, you know, pile up in buses to go to, to, to go vote for Barack Obama in 2012. You have people who are very religious. You have people who are not religious at all. You have people who are uh, young and single, and you have people who are married with lots of kids. Um, and when you have a party like that, it becomes a little bit easier to uh, be tolerant of people who are different from you. If, on the other hand, your party is only made up of people who are demographically similar to you, then you will have a more difficult time with that. And I'm not saying that um, that is just a function of how this works. In the 1870s, when it was the Republican Party that was diverse, it was more tolerant, and the, and, and the Democratic Party was an all-white party, it was a lot less tolerant and the worst political entity that has ever existed in the United States. But the point is that, it, you know, to the extent that, yes, there is, a, there is a degree to which polarization is the result of ideological divergence, but I honestly think if you, it, it, the solution to this problem is, is integrating the Republican Party. That's really the only way, happy, way that this ends. So when are you joining the Republican <laughs> Party? Well, to be honest, you know, my grandparents were Republicans, <gasps> but... That, that was you know, that was, that was, you know, black people in Florida in the 1950s, so it was a little bit different. Right. Could you, I, I don't, I, I want to, one more round, but I want to just ask you one quick thing. You are one of the most DC people I know, uh, and you just moved to Texas. Um, going, to, going to Yoni's point about uh, sorting, geographic sorting, all the different sortings that are going on, what have you learned in the time that you've been in Texas so far? Um, so this is, this is a point that I, I made in the piece, but you know, this, this sort of question of civil war actually goes to like the worst instance in American history without acknowledging the sort of low level of conflict that has typically characterized American political rivalry. And so if you're only thinking like everything's great except for the civil war and you ignore all of these periods of American history that were filled with incredible tumult, sometimes with violence and always with, you know, heated argument, um, you can have an unrealistic perspective about how, about how bad things are. And, you know, the truth is, is like our political discourse is pretty nasty, but the reality, reality is, is like the vast majority of Americans, while they may be extremely frustrated with each other, we don't actually want to kill each other. That's not actually a thing, a play. we're not in that emotional place right now. We're just like really frustrated about similar things. Um, and I think that, you know, um, the thing about, I mean, the thing about San Antonio is that it's, it's, it's not culturally all that, I mean, it's distinct, but it's not culturally like tremendously different from any other big city in terms of like it is a diverse, urban, fairly liberal place. Um, and and it, in that sense, you know, the, the divides between Americans are really within states more than between states. I mean, a, a place like Texas, you know, there's going to be, you know, rural Texas is going to look a lot more like rural New York, and urban New York is going to look a lot more like urban Texas than, you know, might have made sense 50 years ago. Um, but I think the reality is that as crazy as things seem right now, we, we, we are not actually wanting to be at, at each other's throats. This is not a thing that most of us really desire. It's really only the desire of a few rather crazy people who just happen to have large platforms in politics. Right. Um, we're going to go to questions in a couple of minutes, but I, I want to, uh, because I, I just want to hear their answers. Um, I want to talk about 20, uh, 2020 politics for just a minute. Um, we are all 
members of the so-called MSM, we've all been chastened by um, our predictions the last time. Uh, so I'm not asking for predictions per se, but I'm curious to, to hear all of you diagnose what's happening in the Democratic primary right now. Uh, the deep anxiety on the part of Democrats, I know, of course, is that somehow they will figure out a way to blow it um, and pick the wrong person to run against uh, a president who has um, a low ceiling. Uh, Yoni, will you talk a little bit about, and maybe we'll just hear from everybody, and I'm also going to ask Caitlin to talk specifically about her theory of, of Biden. I, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, it was a good theory. I okay. heard it before. Go ahead. Democrats are now down to their final 17 candidates. <laughs> um, Scraping the bottom of the barrel here. And, and uh, you know, it, it's a good punchline, but, but when you look at a party that's putting up that many candidates, you see two things. You see a party that no longer quite knows what it is, uh, which is uh, perhaps alarming for many Democrats, but you also see a party that's having a robust discussion about what it might be, uh, and that's a little bit more promising. Um, and, and I look out at this field of, of Democratic rivals. Uh, they're actually having a bunch of really interesting fights. Uh, they're having fights about uh, economic policy. They're having fights about um, th their political posture to toward their fellow Americans. They're, they're having fights about uh, racial justice. Um, on the whole, I, I think probably all Americans of any partisan persuasion are a little bit better off for, for this kind of a contentious primary. Um, but in the end, we're going to snap back to a single nominee, and it's going to be a binary choice between uh, Donald Trump and, and the Democrats. Is there one type of nominee anymore who would be the best, or is the party so diverse in so many different directions that there is no such thing as a quote-unquote perfect Democratic nominee? Well, I'll call out our issue again, where John Rash had a good uh, thought-provoking essay on, on the, the problems of primary politics, that uh, primary electorates tend to select the candidates they love, uh, and on the whole, do a pretty bad job selecting the candidates who are going to fare best in the general election. Uh, and, and Democrats, interestingly, looked at 2016 and saw what happened uh, when a political party uh, sort of took the hands off the wheel and, and gave, gave the party elders uh, pulled them out of the process and, and gave control to the voters and somehow looked at that result and said, let's move sharply in that direction um, and, and embrace the process that gave the Republicans Donald Trump. Um, and uh, that may lead to interesting places for this Democratic primary. Yeah. Caitlin? Well, Biden, everybody's telling us he's the one and he can do it and I'm so eager to help any effort. But I feel like, you know those trend stories where middle-aged people go on Facebook and they find their high school boyfriend and they, they fall in love again and they run away? I feel like I'm having the opposite experience with Joe Biden, <laughs> where I keep running into him and each time it's just flatlining. So I was, you know, 28 when he first started running. I was a young thing, very pretty, ready, full of life. And he was one of the candidates. And before I even knew his name, he flamed out with all that plagiarism. Then I bump into him again at the Anita Hill hearings. I'm like, oh good, our guy's on this, heading this committee. He's letting everyone say she is a nymphomaniac, he's de deplorable. Then he pops back up the last presidential election for, um, before Barack Obama was elected. And I was so for Obama already, but he's had that quote that, well, the reason why people like Obama is he's the first clean, articulate, and something else African-American, clean, and Al Sharpton sent him this letter saying, you know, I take a bath every day, I take a shower every day. So I was like, ooh, that's really off-putting. And then, when the Supreme Court decided on gay marriage, and Barack Obama gave this really beautiful address to the nation, and I was like, oh, this is so stirring. And then three seconds later, his Biden's wife tweets out, Joe is so happy, he's running around the, up and down the White House corridors with a rainbow flag like a cape. And I was like, oh, God. So I just, and now, like every time he says something, I just feel it's like, you know, everyone's like, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton. She's the one. She's the only one. And I thought, are you guys sure? Because a lot of people really hate her enough to go and vote against her. Yeah, yeah, we're sure, we're sure. And I'm sort of thinking with Biden, I don't know if he can get the job but done. But nobody's sure the way they were, nobody's sure about Biden the way they were about Hillary, but Biden does have this kind of staying power. So, but he's a polling numbers. Adam, do you have a theory of Facebook dating with any <laughs> other particular candidates? Um, I, I don't have a theory either about who's going to win the 
2020 election or who would be the best candidate against Donald Trump. But I will say that I think the, uh, the heterodoxy of the Democratic Party has made it difficult for a one front one or to emerge in part because there's no one who speaks to every constituency of the Democratic Party the way that Barack Obama once did. And it's very easy if you're a Republican, you just go out and you say, so, and you grumble something about NPR tote bags and like <laughs> fancy coffee or something. And everyone's like, yeah, this guy hates the libs just like we do. And you can't really do that. Uh, as a Democrat, you, you have to, you're, you're constantly talking to different types of audiences and trying to find a language that speaks to them all in the same way. And the last candidate who did that um, was Barack Obama, who had a very, both a very unique way of speaking and was very good at, um, our, at, at explaining complex issues, particularly around race and culture, uh, in a way that did not cause everyone to get extremely angry. Um, and I think that the troubles that you're seeing with the Democrats is that they have no common, you know, for lack of a better term, they have no common way of speaking that uh, talks to all the constituencies that make up the Democratic Party and tells them, I care about people like you. Uh, instead, you have different people who are very good at talking to different sections of, those, uh, of, of that Democratic constituency. And as a result, you, you have this sort of very fractured uh, primary where different, um, different candidates are representing very different segments of the party. Do you think that um, social justice speak on the part, I mean, wokeness and scare quotes, um, is, is showing its limitations now? Um, I think that... Or it's broader, broader I think appeal. that kind of... I, I think that there's a way to talk about racial justice in a way that everybody can understand, and I think Barack Obama was particularly good at it, and I think there's a way, there's a language of the academy and of activism that has sort of uh, crept into the primary that I think, uh, you know, obviously alienates particular people because they don't really under, understand or, or that language into them, it sounds uh, maybe like something uh, that it isn't actually. Um, and you see this all the time on Twitter whenever someone erupts about some, you know, some, there's some new woke thing that everybody's mad about and it turns out that it's not actually making that crazy of an argument, it's just couch in, 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 in like sort of bizarrely complicated language. Um, but, you know, I think, I think the Democratic Party has a problem when instead of saying it plain, its advocates are reaching to the language of, of the academy to explain how injustice works. I think that is a, a significant obstacle for anybody who wants to be the nominee for a party that big and diverse. Mm -hmm. And there's no Christian left, I think, is part of what destroys there's the There's a language. huge Christian left. Who's the Christian left? In fact, not only is there a Christian Who's left, the Christian but left? it is precisely the language of the Christian left, as Barack Obama spoke it, that was so good at uniting the, the Democratic Party as a whole. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about black Americans, black the most, the the most church-going demographic in the, the United States. Yes, I totally agree with you on that. But in the idea of coming up against these white evangelicals, there's no language, there's nothing that, that unites them, and there's nothing that shames them. There's nothing that shames them. Because if you speak about Christ, or if you speak about what Christ would do in terms of these immigrants, um, they, they are off to what you were saying, Armageddon. They're into this notion of spiritual warfare, which is very crazy and insane and intense. Well, I can't, I can't say, I don't know that any Democratic nominee would necessarily be able to talk to, um, you know what I'm saying, the, the hardcore of the evangelical right and persuade them of anything. But I do think that if we say that there's no Christian left, we really ignore the extent to which the most Un unifying You're language absolutely right. You're of the absolutely Democratic right. Party is the language You're absolutely of the Christian right. Left. That's still left. You're absolutely right. We'll continue the Christian mm -hmm. left discussion mm -hmm. during Hanukkah, right in front of the, <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant. We'll do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Trying to draw more attention to six than I like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, why don't, we're going to ask people to line up at these two mics uh, if you have questions. Um, and while you're doing that, um, Yoni, very quick question for you. People talk about whether this coming election is a snapback election or, or an exacerbating election, which is to say, uh, will, will, if a Democrat wins, will it be the sort of person who is calm, interior, centrist, or are we now cycling where we're going to have 
more extremes of behavior and ideology. Um, too early to say that for sure, but what's your, what's your worry or anxiety about that? Can you ask me next year? No, I'm going <laughs> to ask you right now. So the, the thing that I worry about is uh, that no matter what happens in 2020, uh, a large number of Americans will remain convinced that this nation is turning against them, that they feel like strangers in their own country, that uh, to see their political opponents prevail at the polls is, is to sign uh, on to their own destruction. Uh, that can happen as much if Donald Trump loses decisively as if he wins. Uh, and that's probably the greatest political challenge fa facing the country at this moment. Right. Um, just one note, when you ask a question, I mean, this is a synagogue, so I always give this, this warning. Um, a, a Jewish question is often two comments and a question that's really a comment. Um, <laughs> Make these short and make them questions, or else I'll move to the next person. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here. It was a very, very informative panel. Um, so a very uh, short question. So this very polarized time we're in, and the election of Donald Trump, he's our president. Um, how do you know the cause of that? Um, how do you know it's because of demographics? So uh, the way I think of this is, is that it's a lot like murder on the Orient Express, where every conceivable suspect has a hand in the crime. Um, I, I don't know that, that any one cause is going to satisfy, uh, satisfy you as, as an explanation for the election of Donald Trump. Uh, you shouldn't go to monocausal explanations. What I can say is that the broader sweep of American politics over the last 20 years has been driven in part by, by this fear. Um, and, and so Trump is in some ways an accelerant and in some ways a symptom, and, and also had other things that, that uh, he articulated on the campaign trail that, that contributed to his success. Uh, but I think we'd be foolish to ignore this in the background. Hey there. Uh, so I was hoping you could talk a little bit about something you promised in the beginning, which was the economic disparity of our country. I know you only had an hour to talk about something you guys have been talking about and we've all been talking about for years, but. Can you tell me something about the economic disparity and how that plays into this that I don't already know? Something, some insight that I don't already have? Well, I can tell you that economic inequality is a tremendous driver of polarization right. because what it does is it, it creates a politics of scarcity uh, in which, you know, a politics of artis, artificial scarcity, I must say, in which people are basically fighting for scraps while um, the people who are extremely wealthy are making out like bandits. And in a system like ours with so many choke points, um, you, know, you can reduce polarization uh, with redistribution. But in a system like ours with so many choke points where it's extremely easy for people who have that kind of concentrated economic power to prevent redistribution, it's, it's very difficult to bring the temperature down. And I think that is a significant driver of what you're seeing just simply based on uh, the political science. There's a, there's, a, there's a book about polarization and inequality um, which I think the title is Polarization and Inequality. But, <laughs> but, but uh, it was written, version, it, okay. and, and this, is, this is one of these things that's really important. It was written prior, many years prior to the Trump administration. So it's not an, an, an ex post facto explanation of how we got Trump. It is a description of the political science literature um, as it relates to economic inequality way before this, was a, this would have been a convenient explanation for what's happening. So the answer is yes. The economic factors are very important in, in creating and maintaining polarization. Um, they're not, as, as Yoni said, it's not the only factor, but it is a part of it. Thanks. Hi. Um, I've always been more focused on federal policy than state and local policy, but I'm finding <coughs> as things change that maybe state and local policy could be the answer to a lot of our problems. Maybe we sort of let people differ and maybe rural areas need less government than urban areas and maybe let those decisions get made and maybe devolve down where we're not fighting about things that maybe there are interests that are different places and let state and local policy have more primacy. So I was wondering if that's something you guys have a view on. If our colleague Jim Fallows was here tonight, he would tell you that um, the view is different from uh, local places around the country that, that often we manage to, uh, to tackle the problems that we're facing at the local level and, and to work across partisan lines. And, and there's a strong element of truth in that. The problem always is what you do on the toughest issues, on the issues that cut to 
justice, the cut, the cut to race, uh, the, the cut to gender, where you see local policies uh, which some municipalities are enacting, uh, which other Americans find intolerable, and that's where we end back in the, in the federal divide. Um, but on many things, that the picture is considerably rosier at the local level than it is at the federal level right now. Do you think the rural states, the less densely populated states, have too much power based on our, uh, according to our system right now? I will we'll side with Adam here that the real split is, is between the, the sparsely populated counties in those states and the dense urban places. Um, and that's a real problem, uh, I think probably a bigger problem, because what you can see across, you asked me earlier tonight, what are the other signs of, of the GOP turning against democracy where it fears losing? Uh, it, it is, at the moment, it's state preemption. Uh, you can't take down a Confederate statue in Virginia without permission right now because the state legislature blocked communities from deciding what should adorn their town squares. Uh, and you can watch that play out on, on bathroom bills, on, on a wide variety of issues where um, within those states you, you see this, this really sharp divide. And that's actually what worries me a lot more is rural areas within states stopping the dense urban areas within their own states, uh, stopping those citizens from, from governing themselves. Right. Sir. Uh, oh, go ahead. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for your hard work as journalists. I know it can be a very risky business right now in particular. And it's, I, I promise you it's not. <laughs> not for people like us. Okay, if you're in Syria, fine. But yeah, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Well, hey, I, I appreciate the, the stress that least you to endure. Um, so I am wondering where us, and I realize I'm not speaking for everyone here tonight, but us true moderates come into these factors you've talked about, um, facilitating listening and, and uh, you know, decency, um, recrafting a more multicultural democracy, um, keeping those, um, uh, integrating the GOP, um, because I've, I've found, much to my own uh, needfully humbling experience, um, as someone who goes, you know, conservative on the spreadsheet, economic and foreign policies, but genuinely abhors birtherism and wants the Confederate flags taken down. Uh, it, it turns out, you know, thinking that I'm being in the center and both parties want to compete for my vote, it turns out they're a lot more interested in the Obama-Trump voters than the Romney-Clinton voters, and we're only 2% of voters and 1% of the country, the Romney-Clinton voters. So I'm wondering, are there different types of centrism we need to be aware of, things that might be too prone to gloss over genuine injustices and are, I mean, again, where do the centrists come into play in this if we find out we're really centrists but also have this humbling experience of realizing not all centrists are alike and politics don't care about us, don't care about us all equally? I, I was kind of up. spacing out during it. No, 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 no. Oh, I, I, I don't want to. It's wanna, okay, I was too. <laughs> I don't want to make a, 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 I'm pointing at Caitlin because Caitlin, Caitlin, you're writing about an issue in which actually most people in America are somewhere near an ambivalent center uh, on this, as opposed to the two different two different extremes. I don't know, maybe there's a lot of polling on that, and that if, if there was a, if it were to be the law of just a very early abortion to eight weeks or twelve weeks, that you would see a real a real change in the country of just very a lot more people unified around that. Well, I I don't want to make you feel bad, but there are a lot more. Uh, moderates who want higher taxes on the rich and very little immigration. There are moderates who want, uh, you know, lots of immigration and lower taxes on the rich. You, yeah. you, you are, you are pretty. I mean, there are a lot more uh, Obama to Trump moderates than uh, Bloomberg Wrong. moderates yeah. to, to use for a lack of lack of a different word. It's been a humbling um, experience. But the truth is, and and you should feel better about this. Most, most Americans just really aren't that ideological. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 2,400 years ago, Sun Tzu wrote in Art of War, if you understand one thing, never back your enemy into a corner because they will fight with the ferocity of 100 people. That's because they have existential fear of their own extinction. A lot of uh, messaging from the right and Trump certainly is couched in fear, and he sort of stokes those fears um, that really rile up the, the, the population. What I haven't really seen much of is any messaging that seems to accept and listen to and listen to those, acknowledge those fears and respond to those fears. Um, do you think there's any place for like addressing the idea of fear, what these people are fearful of more directly? Or maybe another way to look at that question, is there, is there a way to 
couch messaging that reaches out to these people in more of a message of love. I think all three of you should grapple with that. <laughs> I'm the DC chairman of the Cory Booker committee, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, but I'm not a political strategist, so I can't tell you a way to do that. But, I, you know, I'm sure that, I mean, there's certainly, it's not, a, a, I'm sure there is a way to. I'm from California, which has been a minority white state for 20 years, and everything works really well. I think it's sometimes for these people, it's some kind of experience that they have to have themselves before they can really understand this is not some frightening, terrible takeover, it's America. Mm. Yeah, it's probably the greatest antidote to fear is, is to live through something and to face it. Um, and, and you can see it at previous moments in the American past when people have been tremendously fearful. What would it mean to, to grant the franchise to, to black voters in, in the wake of the Civil War? What would it mean to give women the right to vote? Uh, and, and at every exactly. one of these moments where we have enlarged the promise of American democracy, uh, people have felt not just threatened but terrified of the consequences. And then it's happened and, and they've woken up and it's just another Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and I think that that probably is the ultimate antidote to fear. I, I wanna, it's a very good question. I want to push Adam on, on, on one aspect of your question very quickly, which is that you hear this all the time. Like, it, these white voters are frightened mm -hmm. about whatever change they're frightened of. Um, how far do you go to make them feel better about themselves before you simply have to acknowledge that many of them are motivated by, not all, but many people are motivated by race resentment, or at least a blindness to the kind of rhetoric that is coming from Donald Trump and much of the Republican Party. Um, I, I think if you're a politician, you never ever admit that. Um, obviously, I'm not. Uh, but what I will say is that if the next, if, if a Democrat wins in 2020, it will be someone who has either figured out or who already has an exceptional ability um, to get past, to supersede, to somehow hurdle um, the ability of the president and Fox News to scare the crap out of their own constituency. Mm. Mm. Thank you all. I have a similar type question around messaging, and maybe this will resonate more because it's around the word civil war. Um, you know, you talked about setting the tone and the importance of language. And with increasing gun violence, it just, do you feel like using that word, and I've been hearing it thrown around a lot, is propelling or fueling the possibility? And I was really inspired by the piece, um, Frederick Douglass and his composite nation. And so I'm just wondering, can you offer something else besides civil war? Well, that was actually the thrust of my piece, was that we're not close to a civil war that is a fever swamp imagination and that, you know, we should be much more concerned about uh, threats to liberty in American history that have occurred without that kind of mass violence. Um, I think that the, the, I think that the Civil War rhetoric is a bit like the war on Christmas. It's not something that exists, but it is something that some people um, have figured out a way to uh, exploit in their own audiences, and so as long as it keeps riling them up in that way to their advantage, they're going to keep using it. Hi, uh, I'm a British Israeli, and I've been spending the semester here in DC uh, teaching at GW. I don't think there's any causal relationship between my itinerary and um, political turmoil, but if there is, I apologize. <laughs> and that's really my question is... Your problems make us feel better about Right, well, <laughs> what I'd like to know is, is there anything uniquely American? What would you say are the lines of similarity and difference between the kinds of polarization that we're seeing here in the United States and those in Britain or in Israel or other countries? Look, you can look at maps of many of those countries and, and you'll see similar urban-rural divides. Uh, you can divide along the, the, the lines of, of race or class in, in some of these countries, too. W what you see, perhaps most of all, is a crisis of confidence in liberal democracy. Uh, it has not, and this gets to an earlier question on, on how economics play into this, it has not delivered on its promise for most people in the West over the last 30 years uh, that the incomes of millennials uh, are not necessarily going to be higher than those of their parents. Uh, when, when a system fails to deliver for its constituents, 
you, you will tend to find uh, in that crisis uh, the politics of scarcity. Uh, people will start squabbling over what they fear is a shrinking pie rather than working to expand it. Um, so you can see these, these echoes. I mean, I, I think we also need to be attentive to some of the ways in which the United States is distinctive. Our history of race is, is genuinely different and, and genuinely problematic. Um, and, and it propels our politics in lots of really corrosive ways. Uh, but you can also see these echoes across societies. I mean, we have, um, just very briefly, we, we have, there's another subject we haven't really addressed, which is radical changes in communication and even cognition, that downstream from communication. Um, everyone knows everything, including, and that means bad information, good information. We're flooded with all kinds of information. And one of the, one of the things that stokes resentment, obviously, is, is too much information about the way other people are living. And, you know, you, you have, there's an interesting piece I recommend you read in this issue. Um, it's, a, it's a discussion with Tara Westover, um, who comes out of Idaho, obviously, now lives in New York, um, and who argues that, um, and she's made this argument to me, I don't remember if it's in the piece, but she says, you know, the divide between a, a kid who grows up in rural Idaho and a kid who grows up in Washington, D.C. is greater than, um, than, than the divide between a, an African-American kid in a public school in Southeast and a kid in Sidwell or Murray in Upper Northwest. In other words, that, that that line is one of the great demarcating lines and that there are people now, so many people who feel left behind uh, by technology and, and, and what's different now is that they know it in a different kind of way than they knew it before. I think that's just one of those things that we haven't explored because there's too many things to explore. Go ahead. Yeah, Tom Ricks gave one of the early treatments of this topic in, in his blog. He threw out to a, a number of us what was the percent of uh, possibility of having a second civil war, which he was defining as something over 10 to 15 years, which would have a, a sustained level of violence that would require the National Guard to put down. So I'd gained some temporary notoriety by putting out the figure of 60 percent, and that was later picked up by The New Yorker. One of the things that I based it on uh, from seven or eight experiences in the middle of civil wars abroad was uh, weakening institutions. And, and I just wanted to throw that out as one other, because we heard really a great coverage of almost all the issues. But that was the one that I think uh, concerned me most then, and it concerns me far more now, because I think the there's been an acceleration under this administration of deliberately weakening our institutions. I think to have a president that is now using the threat of civil war as a way to bolster his political fortunes is about as reckless as you could get. And when the institutions start to break down, we don't have the way to channel all these disagreements that are so interesting to talk about. Okay. Anyone? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I don't know what to say because I share your concern, I think that is a real problem, that you're exactly right that those institutions exist to mediate conflict and when they are eroded or corrupted in such a way that they serve to either um, increase conflict or settle conflict always in one direction, then you have a very serious problem. But I, I, I don't know, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that means violence is imminent, but I do think that you have identified a genuine problem. Well, this is the, the just something that Yoni and I were talking about just a little while ago. This is, the, this is the question of snapback versus whether we're on some kind of precipitous right. decline. Um, if, if, there are, if there are forces in America that undermine our faith in the basic institutions of, of government, I don't know how that snaps back just with a, when they quote unquote, norms respecting president. Um, I mean, this seems to be longer term, the, the, the big danger we face. And it's, and it's interesting in a way because I'm not just saying this because it's a Washington DC audience, but I've been thinking a lot about um, what a defense of government would look like. And a defense of government would not be called in defense of government. It would be in defense of the Coast Guard and the NIH and the CDC and the United States Marine Corps and NOAA and the people at the Social Security Administration who cut 100 million checks a month and all of the things that work and all the things that people rely on, and, and, and the FBI too, for that matter, and of course the State Department and, and all the rest. And I think that might be, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but that might be the, the, the truly novel moment we're in is that, is that you have a, a president undermining the government he leads. And I don't know, I'll, I'll turn to the historian for the last word on that, I don't know if we've ever seen precisely that phenomenon. 
You know, one of the weird things about this country is that almost everybody pays their taxes. I mean, they're just basic things that work in America that don't work in a lot of the world. We have a basic presumption of good faith for most of our friends and neighbors and, and a, a basic assumption that government generally works most of the time. Um, and, and it's that um, which has eroded it at some points in the past. And when it erodes, that, that's alarming. Um, but but I'll, I'll leave you on an optimistic note. You know, and we, we had uh, the previous moment in the American past when the, the level of the farm-born population was as high as it was today. It led to the Red Scare and the Palmer Raids. Uh, it, it led to uh, the resegregation of the civil service. It, it led to the slamming, got, uh, the, the slamming shut of the gates of immigration. Um, and, and then that party, the Democratic Party, w which had championed these things in, in an enormous backlash against uh, a free and open society, uh, did two things. One was it sparked uh, the first sort of civil liberties revolution. Most of the, the, the ACLU and the other organizations which today protect and defend our civil liberties were born out of that moment of crackdown. Um, the other thing that it did was we saw the Democratic Party harden into uh, sort of a, a coalition of, of those who felt threatened and then lose. Uh, and the Democratic Party after Wilson will, will go into eclipse but it will come back with Al Smith at the top of the ticket, yeah. um, a, a Catholic, uh, a wet Catholic, right? So somebody who, who was pushing in an entirely opposite direction, who appeals, um, who makes a, a stirring uh, denunciation of lynching in the South, which was uh, a fairly brave thing for a Democratic politician at the time to have done, uh, who, who pushes his party to embrace women who have just gotten the vote. Uh, and in that enlarged coalition, he'll lay the foundation for the greatest uninterrupted run of, of political dominance probably in American history, the, the, the FDR New Deal coalition. And so you can watch a party go down this downward spiral of racist revanchism, uh, of assault on institutions, of, of authoritarianism. Uh, but then you can also watch parties in the past bounce back. If they want to be more capacious, if they want to be broader and bigger, they have the capacity to do it. And, and we all of us have, have the chance to push them in that direction. Um, you want to ask a super quick question because you've been standing there for like an hour. Okay. Go ahead. Th thank you. Yeah, I'll also try to end on an optimistic note. So uh, I work for Better Angels, uh, which is an organization that's written in the, in the magazine. Uh, thank you very much for that. I just wanted your opinion because we're going beyond that uh, and how much you think something like Jonathan Haidt wrote that there has been a lot of divisiveness on social media and we hear all these messages about how the other side is so terrible and awful and different and if there were some way to have messages about how in some ways they were similar in terms of you know caring for communities or children uh, that could bring us back together to some extent at least at, at an emotional level. He's saying we should ban Twitter I think is what he's saying but... but you God knows it would help my career. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody do that one? Um, I think that probably most of that work has to happen offline. Um, and I think that, uh, yes, social media is a, an easy place to go if you want to find people screaming at each other. Um, but I think the problem is less that, because you, you, you can find that in 19th century newspapers as well, uh, people being just as awful and just as terrible and making up all sorts of things that then result in real life consequences. Um, but I think... I think there is an extent to which outside of social media, there is, um, and I, I, you know, this is not a liberal argument, I've seen conservatives make it, there is a deterioration of the institutions that once brought different types of people together in other contexts. Um, and I think, I think that is something that is, um, you know, missing from contemporary life uh, that I think would go a long way towards alleviating um, some of what we're dealing with right now. Uh, I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank you all very much for listening to this very serious discussion. Thanks very much.